produce, although he needs no introduction. Edward Michael Dempsey, eldest son of the late John and Mary Fry Dempsey. He was born and raised in Putnam and educated at St. Mary's School. He did his seminary studies in Bloomfield, Connecticut, Rochester, New York, and Paris, France. Father Dempsey was ordained a priest of the Diocese of Norwich on July 15th of 1967 at St. Mary's Church in Putnam and has served several parishes in Eastern Connecticut. He worked in the social services field, especially substance abuse and mental health services in Waterbury, Connecticut. Father Dempsey is now retired from full-time work, but he continues to help in area parishes as requested. He currently lives in North Woodstock, and his siblings are also still residents of Connecticut, John in Killingly, Margaret in Willington, and Kevin in West Hartford. He enjoys gardening and yard work, travel, especially to Ireland and Paris, escaping the worst of New England winters. <laughs> and I can tell you that his book is a heartfelt testimony to the honorable life and public service of his father, Putnam's John Noel Dempsey. And it is a delightful read. So please join me in welcoming Father Dempsey. Thank you, Nicole. Uh, you don't always get to write your own obituary, but I think I just did. <laughs> <laughs> To say it's, uh, it's a pleasure to be here is, is kind of a, an understatement. I mean, Putnam is, is home. So to be home at any point in time is always a delight. It's just that I seem to come home more often now for more funerals than weddings. Um, but as someone said this morning, it seems to go with the age somehow. <laughs> Can't escape it. Um, Three questions seem to come up fairly regularly since the publication of the book in September. Um, so let me share uh, the questions and then my attempt at answers for each of them, and uh, maybe that's a good way to, to kick off uh, any questions you may have, and certainly I would try to answer those as well. The first was, why? Why did you first sit down and decide to write this book to begin with? Well, I have to admit that the, the reasoning and the rationale was not probably the most, um, the most uplifting. My father died on July 16, 1989. Um, was buried here, is buried here in Putnam after a funeral at St. Mary's. On July 16, 1990, so one year to the day after his death, the Connecticut Democrats were meeting in Hartford for their quadrennial convention to nominate candidates for office. I watched that evening, uh, fully anticipating that there'd be a pause somewhere, a remembrance, a moment, something, other than a mention of Dad's name in a succession of Democratic governors from Chester Bowles on through Bill O'Neill, who was the governor at that time. There was absolutely nothing, not a word. I found that shocking. Um, my family and I wrote to each member of the State Central Committee, Democratic State Central <coughs> Committee, and said, we don't understand. In all likelihood, this is the first time in 50 years that Dad was not present at a statewide convention, and yet nothing was said about his absence, about his contribution, whatever. One woman wrote back and said, you're right, I'm ashamed. So the aegis of the book came out of that angst, I suppose, that, that someone who had given a large part of his life, which started here in Putnam at age 21, a large part of his life to politics of the Democratic Party, uh, could be just forgotten swept away a year, 12 months to the day after his death. And I became convinced that if there was anything that I could do to cause people to remember, not to forget, then I was going to try to do it. And so I began writing sort of as things came. And um, it was a, an old manuscript, and I lost it. And um, said to the rest of the other three, um, well, that's that. I can't find it, and I'm not going back and doing this all over again. And the youngest of us, Kevin, said, 
oh, I still have a copy of that. <laughs> so I was no longer off the hook and I had to start over again, and I did. And I must say, it's for the most part, it was a very enjoyable thing. Um, I'm not a historian. I am not an author. This is all, you know, first-time business for me. So um, if there are errors, factual errors, they're mine. Um, I did not go running around to make sure, um, dotting every I and crossing every T, but I did try to be as truthful as possible and to offer a picture of this public figure that somebody else couldn't offer. I mean, he only had four children living, and um, I was one of them, so that perspective was particularly mine and the others, and uh, other people, I think, might have an interest in knowing that side of this public-faced person. The second question that comes up, and not from here, but from other parts of the state is, why over there? Why are you doing book signings in, what do you call it, Killingly, <laughs> Putnam, yes. Portland, yes. The answer to that is very simple. My father spent a lot of his life trying to convince people west of here that there was indeed life on this side of the river. <laughs> I don't know what the rest of the state thinks happens on this side of the river, but I, I have fantasies that they think we're still running around with bows and arrows and uh, bringing down a deer for our dinner. So I don't know, but they certainly don't think very highly of us on this side of the river, particularly the, the quiet corner. And I think without ever saying it, I think my father just made it part of his life's vocation to convince the rest of the state that there is indeed life on this side of the river. And there were some very, very good people on this side of the river. The third was why here in Putnam, well, that's actually part of the second question, why here in Putnam? There was a time, years before he died, that um, I had been home for um, a funeral. Uh, some of you may remember Tommy Scrabo, Stan and Joan's son, had died tragically out in Milwaukee. And as I was standing at his grave, I looked up to where my grandparents and the great aunt had buried, and you know, I thought, um, we ought to do something because this cemetery is getting full, and sooner or later, if we don't do something, we're all going to end up in Hurlbut's Pond. <laughs> so I said, Okay, um, one Sunday I was home, my folks were living in Groton, and I said to my father, I want to talk to you about something. He said, oh, all right, what? And I said, have you given any thought to when the time comes, you know, where you want to be buried? Oh, my God, Mother, he said, would you listen to this one? Look, look at the table yet he brings this up. <laughs> it wasn't sex, but sex and death were not, <laughs> not suitable topics for the table. I said, but Dad, you know, you have ideas, I have ideas, and I don't want to get it wrong, and then for the rest of eternity to hear you saying, look at that, he screwed that up, he didn't even get that right. So I said, I'm just asking, where would you want to be? <coughs> well, for God's sake, he said, with all the education, you're the dimmest bulb in the pack. I said, all right, yeah, why, where? Home, he said. Home, of course. And home has no other meaning in our family than, than Putnam. So it got solved. I talked to Larry Belrose and said, you know, is there anything available in that section where my grandparents are? And he said, I'll check and see. And I said, you know, the new section is being developed, but it's going to be muddy and it's and if we ever needed it and we planted him in mud, I mean, uh, no, no, this would not work. And he said, let me see what I can do. So he called the next week and he said, well, there was to have been a footpath in that section where your grandparents are, but they, they don't need the footpath. The hearse can drive right up to it. So I said, all right, well, can we get uh, a lot there? He said, yeah, yeah, there's a whole swath. He said, you know, two, four, six, whatever you want. So I said, four, four will do. So, and I said, for God's sake, Larry, you know, 
get the deed, send me the, the deed, I'll pay you the thing. Um, but don't, for God's sake, don't ever say to my father that we bought a lot in the footpath. <laughs> <laughs> That'll become an issue for all eternity as well, you know. Where they put me? In the footpath. In the footpath, no less. So, I said nothing. He later said to me at some point, well, I don't suppose you ever did anything about that, that matter that we discussed. I said, oh, you mean the cemetery? Yeah, well, whatever. I said, no, I did, Dad. I did. I said, uh, we now own a lot at St. Mary's. Oh, fine, he said. Send me the, the deed and uh, I'll send you a check. Mm -hmm. And I said, no, hear me and understand me. I bought it. I paid for it. I have the deed. And the next time you tell me that I'm out of the will, you're out of the lot. <laughs> <laughs> did not score me any particular points. In the but as it turned out, you know, I put the, the thing away in the box with the rest of the things you're supposed to keep separate and, and know where they are and stuff. I never thought we were going to need it, but then in 89, he got sick and 30 days later was, was dead. And after being at Gilman's on that uh, Tuesday, my mother said, can we swing by the cemetery? And I said, sure, why? And she said, I'd just like to know where we're going tomorrow. <laughs> I said, fine, fair enough. So we drove up and they had dug the grave and the astroturf or whatever was there and so forth. So um, she turned to me and she said, uh, you did well. I said, well, what did I do? I mean, I just bought the lot, that's all. She said, yeah, but look where it is. And I hadn't realized he's buried four stones from his parents. And that had nothing to do with me. That's either Larry Belrose, God rest him, or, you know, Grace, whatever. I don't know, but it was not my doing. And I said to her at that time, you know, Mom, Dad asked me uh, about the plot and asked me where it was. And I said, I don't know. It's in the section where Nan and Grampy are. But other than that, I don't know. I, I didn't care, really. At least we had it. And we, were, we weren't going to be in Hurlbut's Pond. So I was fine. Um, but he, I said to her, you know, he asked me one time what I got. And I told him I got a four-plot lot somewhere in that section. Yes, yeah, she said. I said, well, do you know what he said to me? No, she said, why? Well, see, no, that's not, we don't need that. There's only two of us to go in there. <laughs> uh, Dad, oh, he said, I thought they'd put you somewhere. <laughs> I'm sure they would put me somewhere, but not necessarily my choosing. So <laughs> we'll all be there together at St. Mary's and not in the pond. So. <laughs> The third and, and final question is um, that gets asked is, why not? You know, why write a book like this now? Well, because, first of all, I'm getting older and I don't know how much uh, legibility is left in me, so I thought I'd better do it now while I still had some brainwave function. Uh, the other is that, um, going back to that first question about not forgetting and remembering, it just seemed to me that the way public life, political life, is going at the present time, it seemed important to me to be able to say to the generations coming behind us that there was a day when things were different from the way they are now. There was a day when somebody said something and yes meant yes and no meant no and you didn't have to equivocate, you didn't have to worry or wonder. He said yes, but does that mean no? There was a time when yes meant yes and no meant no, and when people went into uh, public life um, for a very simple reason, and I think that was my father's reason, um, because it was an opportunity to do something for people. And I'm not sure that that is still the case. My, my sense sometimes is that it's kind of the other way around. I go into public life to see what I can get rather than what I can give. And that, that would to this day appall my father, and certainly it was one of the reasons, if not the major reason, why in 1970 he announced that he would not seek the nomination and would not run again. Uh, he had done it for 10 years, and you know, he smiled and said, you know, enough is enough, and I'm not any you know, younger. He was only in his 50s, I mean, he was not an old man by any stretch. A lot of people blamed my mother, she was never happy with public life, she finally you know, pulled the trigger and said, this is it. 
none of that was true. Um, Dad's reason for getting out was that he saw another generation and another day coming, and it was not his generation, and it was not his day, and basically people were seeking from public life what they could get and not what they could give, and he said, you know, fine, that's, it's not for me. They're, they're welcome to their day, they're welcome to do whatever they see fit to do, but it's not for me. So, let them at it. I'm done, I'm, I'm out of here. Um, and that's, that was it, basically. Um, my father was a person who, to the annoyance of us all, probably first of all and foremost to, to my mother, who would find good in no matter the disaster of a situation in which we found ourselves. I'll give you an example. Um, when he was very young, in the, in the 1940s, he was uh, an alderman. And um, the party decided to run the upstart against the incumbent Republican mayor. And for whatever reason, my father agreed or got coerced, whatever, he decided to, to run. And he did run, and he was soundly and roundly trounced. <laughs> Fair enough, you know. In January of that year, the only job that he had, full-time job, was as clerk of the water department. Um, the new, the returning administration fired him. Um, two weeks later, he had a part-time job as secretary of the police commission. He was fired. So in the 40s, with me in tow, with a wife as well, uh, no job, no income. Within a week, he got a phone call from a woman he didn't know from Eve. And she said, I'd like to sit down and talk with you. Um, I have something that I think might be of interest to you. And she commiserated with him about losing the election and losing his job and so forth. And Dad said, you know, fine, okay. Her name was Chase Going Woodhouse. She was the first woman elected to Congress from our second congressional district. She lived here in eastern Connecticut in a place called Scotland. She ran a farm, raised sheep. She was an economist by training. I think my father knew her name, but he certainly knew nothing about the woman, or very little about the woman. They met for lunch, and she said, look, I'm looking for somebody to be my eyes and ears here in the district. I want you to be my, my eyes and ears here. I want you to run the office. And Dad said, you know, with all due respect, Mrs. Woodhouse, I know nothing about the federal government. I know nothing about current legislation. I can barely tell you who the president is. She said, that's not the point. You know here. You know Eastern Connecticut. That's what I need and that's what I want. So he became her field secretary for the next two years. She was ousted from office. She went back two years after that. It was that kind of situation that he would say to my mother's chagrin, ah, what you see? Fired one week, new job the next. And with whom? This woman that he always credited as being his mentor. She instilled in him that there was nothing he couldn't do just because he came from eastern Connecticut or the quiet corner or whatever. No, 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 she said, you, know, you can do it. He ran for lieutenant governor a few years later and was again roundly, soundly defeated. And the only Democrat elected that year was Abraham Ribicoff, the governor. The governor and lieutenant governor did not run as a team at that point. They ran separately. Abraham Ribicoff was elected, and every other constitutional office was Republican. So Governor Ribicoff said to my father, you know, where do you think you're going? And he said, well, I've got to go look for a job, you know, for one thing. No, 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 he said, you can't leave me with all of them baying at the door. I need somebody here. <laughs> so he became the governor's executive aide. And again, he said to my mother, see, you see? A few years later, after serving as lieutenant governor for a couple of years, uh, after being his executive aide for four years, he ran for lieutenant governor again, this time in tandem with the governor. They were both elected, both fine. He did that for two years as lieutenant governor, living still here in Putnam as he did all those years. And 
suddenly Governor Ripkoff decides to answer the call from John Kennedy, who had just been elected in November, to become part of the cabinet in Washington. Constitutionally, the governor re resigns, the lieutenant governor becomes governor. said to my mother, you see? You see? But he had been, he had to win a much bigger battle than that because when he was executive aide and they were asking him to run for lieutenant governor, his salary was the governor's salary. In fact, he was making more than the governor because he was a state employee and the governor's salary was set constitutionally. I think his salary was 15-2 at that point. The governor's salary was 15,000. Dad's was 15-2. So he had to come home one night and say to my mother, they want me to run again. And she said, you did that. It didn't work out so well, did it? Just leave well enough alone. We're fine. No, 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 no. I owe it to them. Well, that set her off. You, know, you don't owe them anything for God's sake. He thought the winning argument was, but mom, they give us a car. <laughs> she said, what about the salary? Well, they give us a car. <laughs> now her hackles were up. What about the salary? Five. He'd have to go from 15 to, to five, but with a car. <laughs> and her response was, you tell me, how do I cook a car? <laughs> but then two years later, he was lieutenant governor. The governor resigned. He became governor. And he said to my mother, you see? <laughs> We lived with that all of our lives, you see. God is good. Don't ever worry about what's coming. It'll be all right. I'm not sure that we're dying day whether my mother fully accepted that or not, but eventually you have to give in and just say, oh well, oh well, you know. Um, so with that as a background, the, you know, the, the reason for publishing the book now or having it published now was to, to try and convince people coming up that there was another day when things were different and that uh, uh, when they look at Washington and the chaos in, in the, the Congress at the moment or look at, at Hartford and the fighting, the bickering, the, the lack of bipartisanship, I'm not sure Dad would ever use that word. I mean, he was much more comfortable saying, you know, look across the aisle, shake your hand across the aisle. That to him was just a way of doing business any more than was any different here. If, if you had green beans and the guy across the street had strawberries, the natural thing to do was to give him green beans and he'd give you strawberries. I mean, it didn't make any difference that he was Protestant and Republican. I mean, that didn't enter into it. It was what needed to be done or what made sense to do. Therefore, it's what you did. That day seems to be perishing. I hope it's not uh, extinct. I hope it's not gone. Uh, I hope that that day can come back, but it will only come back if there is another generation that can remember that there was a day when this was the rule and not the, and not the other. As you can tell, I may be French, Canadian, and German, but I'm half Irish, and um, I can talk forever, so I'm going to stop at this point. People say to me, even now I've been ordained 56 years ago, why, why, do, you still have your, why do you still have your homily written now? I said, well, it's not in self-defense, but it's in your defense. <laughs> if I haven't written out, then there is a point at which I have to stop. It does come to an end. And you really want to know that there is going to be an end to this. Otherwise, I can tell stories, I can ad lib, I can go on. A wonderful gift, but not always to the benefit of a congregation or an audience at all. So let me stop with that there. Is that OK, ma'am? Uh, and if there are any questions, I certainly would try to field them and feel free. I mean, there's not anything, there's not anything off, you know, off target. Yeah. Can you tell the story about um, the gentleman that came to your father's office in a pouch or a bag? I never knew the man's name, and I don't know what, what he wanted or whatever. But he had a paper bag. Um, and as he had made a pitch about something or other, and um, as he was leaving, he slid the bag across Dad's desk toward him. And Dad was a bit puzzled and opened it, and it was cash. <coughs> and um, my father was not an angry person. In fact, some of his staff would say they never saw him angry. But if they were there that day, they did. Whether they recognized it or not, they saw him very angry. He took the bag in one hand, and the man in the other hand 
opened the door with the, the bag hand and announced to the rest of the office, this man is leaving and he will not be back, and pushed him and the bag out and banged the door behind him. He came home so hurt that someone would think he was open to that kind of nonsense, that somehow or other a few bucks in a paper bag were going to you know, win the day for him or his cause or whatever. Come in, come in, come in. Um, how are you? Fine and dandy. Good to see you. Yourself. I am fine. Thank you. Good to see you. Thanks. Hi. Um, it, was, it was hurtful to him. And um, I know that um, you've got to, well, at least we say, you've got to have a thick skin in order to survive in public life. And I think that's probably true. And to a certain extent, he did. Um, but he was an extremely sensitive person and took things to heart, and though he may not have shown it and would not for the world make an issue of it in any public sort of way, he would then come home and say to my mother, you know, and the, the most effective way to get under his skin, to hurt him in any way, was to go after one of us, my mother or one of the four of us. That was untenable, and that would send him into orbit. When the family first moved, I, I, I would say we, but I never really lived in that house. I, mean, I was in the seminary out the street for the five and a half years, then got sent to Rochester after that for good behavior, I presume. Um, <laughs> but anyhow, when the family moved into that house in Hartford, it was a house in that neighborhood. And it was, wasn't long after that that the state police commissioner, Leo Mulcahy, came to his dad and said, um, I need to talk to you about something. Dad said, sure, you know, what's, what's going on? Well, I think, uh, and there was no fence around the house at that point. It was just a house sitting there, you know. There's a fence around it now. Um, we need to do something about security. And Dad said, uh, you know, I'm fine. You know, I have a policeman who drives me to work and stays in the office, and I'm, I'm fine. And he said, uh, I'm not worried about you. Dad said, what, what's going on? He said, We've had a couple of threats, and we need to take them seriously um, against the children. That ended the discussion. Dad said, Leo, do whatever you need to do. And from that point forward, there were state policemen in the house 24-7. Uh, um, and for that, uh, he made no apologies whatsoever. And if you wanted to get to him or worry him or niggle him in any way, do it through one of the kids. Yeah, you'd get his attention real quick. Anything else? Yes. What would you say your father's greatest accomplishment as governor was? I'm sure, he, I know he had several, but what would you say the top one would be? The things that were closest to his heart, I think, were um, the situations, the life situations of folks who had very little going for them and needed and assist a hand. Uh, Nicole has done very well in putting together this, this board of mom and dad and their annual treks, or in one of the office, um, to kids. Um, Walt Woodward, in, um, in one of his articles about dad, said uh, there's never been a governor who challenged uh, kids at Seaside and Waterford to more races every year and lost every single one of them. Kids, I think, were probably his major accomplishment, uh, in, in his eyes, anyhow. And that little girl um, who was kneeling down, well, dad is kneeling down. Uh, they were at Oak Hill School for the Blind, as you see, around Christmas time. He used to BS them with, you know, uh, we brought this cake, and do you have any idea how many eggs I had to break last night? <laughs> sure, my arm is nearly stiff with trying to turn that down and turn that down. And the kids would roar and laugh and say, no, 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 no. Well, this little girl afterwards came up and she said to him, um, you sound very nice, but I want to know what you look like. And he looked at my mother and then he looked at the, the boss of the seas that, uh, Oak Hill School and said, and he just said, yeah, go down. So dad knelt down in front of her and she put her hands up and she said, oh yeah, she said, you look as nice as you sound. <laughs> so I think I'd have to say that it probably had things to do with the kids, whether it was seaside in the summer when 
all of those groups of special kids had, uh, had a week there, and he would go down and lose another race to whoever happened to be there, whether it was his um, accomplishments with, um, well, we used to call it the Department of Mental Retardation, which didn't exist until his time, but now called the Department of uh, Intellectual Disabilities. It was always those situations that when they worked, when they were able to um, bring something positive about that, I think he took the greatest pleasure. And you should know that some of those started right here. I can remember the Sunday when after Mass we went home and Dad said to me, I've got to go back, why don't you come with me? And we went to visit a family, um, they're long gone now, so I don't think it makes any particular difference. Their name was Benoit, or Benoit, or Benway, since we spell it and talk about it in so many different ways. And we went uh, to see them. They were from St. Mary's as well. And um, they said, you know, Mayor, and they had a child who was now in his mid-30s who had severe retardation and um, whom they had always kept at home. And they said, we want to know what happens to him when we're gone. And they knew very well, as Dad did, the only alternative in those days was an institution. Whether it was Mansfield or Southbury, training schools, we called them, um, glibly. Um, and that, that just chewed at him. What happens to that kid when his parents aren't here? What can we do? Another was a friend of uh, a family who was an optometrist here, who had a son with Down syndrome. And when Dad was in having his eyes checked or getting new glasses or something, uh, he was talking to this kid and then said to his father, you know, wouldn't it be wonderful if, if he could get on a bus every morning and go, like every other kid, and come home at night? So the Department of Mental Retardation came about, but then the regional centers came about. And for that reason, whatever is left of the regional center here still carries his name. There are only two things that I'm aware of in this state that have his name. One is the regional center here in Putnam. The other is the hospital in Farmington, for which he scrapped and fought from his days in the legislature and uh, was finally named for him in the, uh, oh, must have been in the 70s, 78, 79, somewhere around there. Um, so I would say if I, if I had to push and shove, um, I would say it was the services that he somehow was able to affect or change or bring about that had to do with kids and kids who needed a leg up, kids that needed a help that maybe even their families couldn't provide. Thank Thanks you. for the question. Anything else that, uh, yes, by all means, thank you. Um, I'm curious about your father when he was growing up, you know, the story of something from his childhood. Well, he came here in 1925. Uh, since he was a January birth, um, he was on the cusp of 11, but he was 10 in September of that year when he came. He came from the only country he'd ever known, from Ireland, where he was born, where his parents were born, where they had given birth to him and raised him for those 10, 10 plus years. So he came fully equipped as an Irish schoolboy with short pants and knee socks and um, did not quite fit in uh, in the way in which he looked. What year are we talking about? 1925, yes, 25. And Israel Putnam was the school. And he used to laughingly say, I think I was in every classroom in that school that first week because they had no idea where to put him or what to do with him. Whatever he brought was unintelligible in terms of they didn't have grades, there were forms and this and that. And one of the one of the memories I have best um, of those earliest years were from, um, is from uh, Loretta Johnston, Loretta St. Ange Johnston, who said to me one day, you know, Eddie, I knew your father before I ever met him. I thought, well, now there's a trick. Tell me, how did, how did that happen? She said, well, I can remember that first day or maybe the second day at Israel Putnam. We were all outside in the schoolyard, and the word went around, there's a new kid, and he talks funny. <laughs> My father's accent certainly came with him. He did not drop it at the port in Boston. Um, so 
two scores. He had short pants and, and knee socks, which was not the, the rule here. The second was um, he talked fun. Mm -hmm. On December the 8th, that year, 1925, they were living on South Main Street with my grandmother's siblings, all old maids and bachelors. Not much of a house for a 10-year-old kid. I often think to myself, how did he survive? I mean, I'm sure they were lovely people, but they were old people, you know, and not used to being parents. His parents were old. They didn't marry until their 30s and 40s. They were in their 40s and 50s when they came here. Well, anyhow, the, the mill, my grandfather, my grandmother, and my father all worked in Putnam Woolen eventually. Um, that morning, my, they were walking to St. Mary's because it was a holy day, as it was yesterday, and um, down one hill and up the other hill, and they got to Bell Roses, um, neighbors up the top of the hill, and my grandfather turned around and said to him, John, you're hanging behind. For goodness sake, you're going to be late for Mass. Move it. And you had to go to the 6, because the, the mill, the first shift was 7. And Mass was short. It was 30 minutes, but you had time to, to get from the house to St. Mary's, St. Mary's down to Putnam Bull, and, and still be on time for the 7 o'clock whistle. Um, and he noticed my father was crying. So he went back, and he said, what's the matter, son? What's the matter? And he said, you know, before we came here, the guys in Ireland used to tell me when they knew I was coming here, it gets so cold over there, little boy's ears just fall off them. <laughs> <laughs> and I think mine were about to fall off. <laughs> <laughs> so my grandfather took his muscle off, wrapped it around my father's head, saying, there you're fine, you're grand now, come on, we'll be late for mass. And off they went. <laughs> There are those, but my grandparents were not great ones for telling many stories. I mean, in, in, their, in their parlance and their life experience, everything's fine. My father never did wrong. He was a perfect child. My mother would tell you that's not quite the same case. And we discovered over the years there were stories that went around that weren't that of a perfect child by any stretch. Um, but they didn't say a lot about those years, you know, uh, except that... They had this wonderful son who was perfect in every way, who did grow up to make them very proud and very happy. And thankfully, his mother did live to see him become governor and uh, lived uh, with us, um, with them, uh, in Hartford until her death in uh, 67. So um, it, was, it was a very strange year. Um, my sister had become engaged the Christmas before. and She had said to me, Ours is going to be the first wedding you do. So and I didn't even have a date for ordination then. So she's pressuring me to get a date from the bishop who was not happy about giving a date ahead of time. But anyhow, um, so I was ordained the 15th of July. Uh, Margaret was married um, the 7th of August. Nana died the 11th of August and was buried on the 14th of August. So, in one month, we had gone through the whole cycle of, you know, returning son from foreign shores, daughter, only daughter, getting married, and now uh, Nana dying. Um, they were tough days. I mean, it was like you didn't know exactly. You don't quite know what, what to do. And um, my, my father, as an only child, and then with his mother, the surviving parent, living with, them, with us, he was the one that had to say to my mother, you know, this can't go on. You know, we've got an ordination, we've got a wedding. Um, she can't be here, you know. And there was a sister, Mother Mary Bernadette, who had said to my father, don't ever worry. When the time comes, we'll take your mother and she'll get the best of care and so forth. And my mother said, absolutely not. I told your mother she would never have to leave this house, and she won't. <clears throat> So Putnam, again, came to the rescue because my father said, you can't keep doing this 24 hours a day. I mean, she had bells and this and that in the night. So um, Mary Tulin, God love her, who lived across Church Street in the yard, a retired nurse, uh, dad said to her, Mary, could you? And she said, absolutely. So long as you can get me home on the weekends, and get me back Monday morning, I'm good. So Mary moved in, and since she was Mary and my mother was Mary, if either Mary said something, it was good to go. So, <laughs> yes, ma'am. I was thinking when you started to talk about the, um, the Irish people and the Irish Catholics and how they were, you know, 
and, and your sister getting yeah. married and all of that. Uh, Mo and I were dating back then. This is 67, correct? Generational <laughs> information, you see. She's distancing herself from the elder. Because yeah. <laughs> yes, we were married in 68. Yes. But anyway, Mo has said to me, he asked me, he said, oh, would you like to come? I guess the Kadia family was invited to the your uh, celebration. Yep. And I said, you know, and I knew who your father was and everything like that, but I didn't, you know, and I knew your sister, she was, and I think my year, a year behind me in school. But anyway, so I said, okay. So the entire Putnam High School gym, am I correct? Do I remember correctly? Yes. But like the whole town was there. I mean, we had a table, you know, I was sitting with my then to the in laws, et cetera, et cetera. But I was just amazed. I just, Wow, and now you're saying all, all of this, this whole big party had, was going on, yeah. and then everything else was happening too. But yeah. I, I do remember that day when they had the, the celebration for you, and now you're saying all these other things were happening, your sister and yep. your grammar. And, and it was a bone of contention. You know, I was in France, and uh, my father said something about the menu for the reception, and I said, I don't want the reception. <laughs> <laughs> I wanted to have cookies and coffee. Don't forget that. <laughs> he ignored what I said I and know. sent back, well, we're thinking about chicken and ham. And I, yeah. I said, I don't want, and finally my mother said, give it up, give it up. <laughs> yeah. So we did. We had a luncheon at uh, the uh, auditorium, well, no, gymnasium, gymnasium at, yeah. the, at the high school. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. But I was thinking now, when I'm thinking of that, little did I know all these other things. The other stuff is going on as yeah. well. Yeah. yeah. Things in yeah. your life. Yeah. But that's the way it is with families, I think. Yeah. Or at least it was. Yeah. I mean, I don't know that it is anymore. Um, but it's it's what you know because it's what you've experienced. Yeah. And uh, I, I think you all know my mother just died recently. Yeah. And. Um, Several years ago, I mean, the woman was very clear-minded up to up to the end. Um, I said to her, you know, she lived in a little house on Alexander's Lake, opposite shore from where we had had a cottage when we were kids growing up. We always talked about the South Shore and the North Shore. Um, Mom, if you can't, you know, stay here. What would you want to do? Where would where would you want to go? And she looked at me, in much the way my father would, and said, you know, all the education, you don't understand pretty much. And she said, well, I certainly don't want to go to one of those places. <laughs> but she had spent her last years up and down to uh, Matulitis and this place and that place where half of Putnam was, you know. And she was quite clear that was not to be her future. I said, okay, um, if you can't stay here and you don't want to go there, well then, well, I sure as hell don't want to live with one of you. <laughs> Both legs gone at that yeah. point. She turned around and said, I'm staying right here, and walked in the door. <laughs> and she did. You know, she lived there till, till she died. Um, and that's what she wanted, and it just, you know, a couple of times we said to ourselves, how, how are we going to do this? It, that's not a question. It's going to be done, and thank God there are wonderful, wonderful services available that, that take a lot of the stress off. Um, hospice saw my father out of this life at home. Uh, they saw my mother out of this life at home, and I can't say enough good things about them. You know, to, to have that kind of service available in uh, a small community on this side of the river, yeah, yeah. We do get some things right, and we do do the right here as well. Anyone else? Yes. Just a quick something or other. Yeah. Um, I was born in Bridgeport. I, the flood hit Putnam and the Winstead area where my father was from, same time. Yeah. Uh, my father threw me at the time I was about six in the truck, packed up groceries and everything, and headed up to Winstead. Over the years, your dad used to come to Winstead. He participated in the parades. He'd show up. It was like Putnam and Winstead were one and the same. You were the quiet corner. We had no name. Yeah. <laughs> you were in the amorphous middle. You didn't have the money. You didn't have the Aborigines that they thought lived out here. <laughs> so I don't know who you were. But that kind of thing struck 
a note with Dad. People in Winston mattered. And the only thing that he ever said to anyone in Winstead was, I commiserate with you, but I have to tell you, Putnam never lost a soul. We never had one death here in 55. And somehow or other, that again, you know, the flood came, yes, but we never lost anyone. You know? We may have come close. I'm sure we did. And misery, yeah. Yeah, all you'd have to do is look at the pictures of downtown Putnam in 55 to see misery. Or to go to, to friends that you just had a graduation party with in June. Their house is, you know, mud. The garage that you had the party in is gone, down the river someplace or other. Um, and to my mother's credit, um, and my mother, was a, she was a homemaker, she was a wife, she was a mother, no education beyond... Uh, high school and she left Putnam High in the middle of her senior year because her family were seeking another job, this time in Malden, so she graduated from Malden High School, though she never knew a soul at Malden High School, and everybody here said, I don't worry about them, you belong here. So she always went to the reunions here in Putnam because she was told she was one of them, you know. Um, she forced us, the four of us, um, to go downtown in that um, aftermath of August 19th. Um, and when um, some poor National Guardsman at the, the underpass on um, Front Street said, no, no one can come in, she said, oh yes, <laughs> one way or the other, these are going in and they're going to see. And she marched us halfway down Pomfret Street because half of Pomfret Street was gone. And she said, I want you to see, see Nana's house over there? And we'd only seen the river, especially in the summer, as this, this trickle, you know, coming over the falls. By the time it got down, it was, you know, the river was not much. Certainly not something you were going to say you'd canoe on of it. It was a trickle. And there was the Irish American Club. Well, that was the Irish American Club. And the picture still hanging on now an exposed wall, and the rest of it gone. Rafferty's plumbing, gone. And she kept saying to us, never forget what water can do. And that, that impressed me some, you know. She, um, she just had it in her mind this was an event she wanted the four of us to see and hopefully not forget. And it's not just a trickle. You see what happens. What can happen? Our river was the Mad River. Yes, yes. <laughs> it was mad that day. And for Waterbury, it was the Naugatuck. You know, everybody, well, a lot of people got hit, and it was hard to know where to go or where to sympathize or whatever. But at that point, my father only had one worry, and that was, that was here. You know, and how are we going to get, and how are we going to survive? There was one point, probably while the, uh, the magnesium was going off in the night, and making us, you know, very happy as kids, that pink oh, skies. <laughs> then the next day, I'm picking up the spools, burnt spools that had flown through the air and so forth. We hadn't seen my father for almost 24 hours. And there were no phones, and there was no, no internet or anything of the sort. And my mother just said, you know, he'll be fine. He'll be fine. Don't worry. He'll be fine. We didn't know which side of the river he was on, or when we were going to see him again, or, but, you know, he'll be fine. We grew up with that kind of confidence. It may, be, it may have been a bit foolhardy, but I don't know. You know uh, as Dad would say, turned out all right, didn't it? So <laughs> you, can't, you can't argue with the, the end result. Anyone else? Anything? An aside yeah. that I have for yeah. Teddy was uh, his uh, amazing lack of uh, forgetting anyone. Yes. He, he and his family, when they came to America, lived upstairs on High Street. Yes. My mother's family lived downstairs. And he never forgot my mother. Every time I saw him, no matter where, uh, some functions, I was a secretary of the Chamber of Commerce. Yeah. When we opened Route 52, finally finished the turnpike, uh, he was there. And the first thing he came over to me is, how was your mom? And uh, he'd come into my store. How are your mother doing? You know, it was it was uh, quite quite a, quite a, uh, 
and let, really me, let me One disabuse you of any yeah. thoughts you may have that that particular knack is genetic. It is not. <laughs> we won't hold that against you. There are four of us that will tell you it is not genetic. Right. I, I'm not sure. I've asked him a number of times, you know, what is it? You know, yeah. And all he ever said to me is, you've got to associate. And I remember the example he used. He said, I can go into a, a meeting or a crowd or something, and I see a face, and I, I know the face, but no name is coming and so forth. Then I see a kid with his arm in a sling, and I say, Hey, how's that boy of yours with the broken arm? Oh, I think it gave him time then to say, oh yeah, that's Pete, that's Pete, that's right, yeah, yeah, yeah. Wonderful. But yeah, but those kinds of things seemed to come naturally to him, yeah. and it was yeah. a wonderful gift. Yeah, he was known everywhere for, yes. that, for that particular act. Yeah. I had a classmate uh, here in grammar school whose name was Eugene Smith, still lives in this area, and um, he said to me one of the finest things that ever happened. His mother, um, his mother was sick for a long time, and um, my father was somehow under the impression that May was not going to last all that long. And I think that had been confirmed to him by people in the medical profession who said, "You know, May's for it." I mean, you know, well, she lived a long time after that. And when the end didn't come, or near the end, she was at St. Francis Hospital in Hartford. And Smitty was there at lunchtime one day, and Dad walked in. Hmm. Well, May, what are you doing here? You know, Dave Kimball would do you just as well. <laughs> and they had this natter about the old days and this yeah. and that. Smitty to this day will tell me, you know, my mother never forgot that your father never forgot who she was. Yeah. And the same is true of your mother. Yeah, that's you know, yeah. Um, yeah. I, I can't explain it except that he had this one and. It is a gift, I think, to be able to I remember. So. I don't have it either. <laughs> yeah, the, I think our generation must have got skipped on that particular yeah, gene or something. Right. About that. Thank you for remembering that. Anything else? Yes. The part that hit home to me was when you said you had to get rid of your, you got rid of your grandmother's things and you wished you hadn't. When I she, get. When a lot made, of stuff at my house, but not the right stuff. Yeah. When she made up her mind that she was going to move with them, my father had parceled that on to my mother and said, you've got to talk to Nana. I don't want her to stay here in Putnam by herself. I'm the only one. We're the only family. And my mother said, yeah, but you're forgetting it. Your mother is my mother. <laughs> oh, yeah, he said, but she won't argue with you. She'll fight me, but she won't argue with you. So my mother's plotting and planning how she's going to say to her mother-in-law, you know, we really don't want you to stay behind, and I know you've been on your own all these years, but, you know, and there's only the one house you're going to have to share with all of us, but, and one Sunday, she used to come up to Sunday dinner, and one Sunday, my mother had lost a considerable amount of weight, and she was looking very tired, and my grandmother said, it's so unfair, you have all of this on your shoulders, you have the kids to sort out, get new schools, and this and that and the other thing, and he's off, if you take a deep view of my father's not participating fully in the family life, he's off doing whatever he does. Oh, it's such a mess, she said, and all I have is my few bits and pieces, and uh, Jim the Swap will take the rest. <laughs> and my mother said, so you're not staying? She said, why would I stay here? And she said, fine, you're more than welcome, you know that, I know that. So she said to my father, another big one. And you didn't have to lift a finger, did you? <laughs> Your mother was coming to Hartford with us. And in preparation for that, at I think probably Christmas or Thanksgiving when I was home from the seminary, she had put together a whole bunch of things, pictures of her brothers and sisters and stuff. And she made me take them down to the fireplace in the backyard and destroy them all. And to this day, I truly regret that I didn't argue with her or lie to her and tell her I would do it tomorrow or something. I don't know. But somehow, and I said, but why, Nan? You know, we, no, these will end up in Jim the Swappers. I don't want them. I don't want them to go that way. And they would. They would have been yeah. sold for the picture frames or, or whatever it was, and she wasn't going to have it. So I did what, what I was told to do. I'm very dutiful, you see. <laughs> <laughs> there are bishops that would tell you that is not the case. <laughs> but I did on that occasion, you know, and I do regret it. I really do. Because we, I went 
through pictures with my cousin and my aunt, who lived to be 106. And we went, I had seen a lot of the pictures. We got to the very bottom of the box, and there was this picture with all cracks. And she says, oh, give me that for a minute. And she says, this is the first family Kadir picture that was ever taken. Yeah. And I said, let me have it. Yeah. And I took it and had it fixed. You know, I had somebody yes. repair it. Yeah. And I gave a copy to each one of my yeah. siblings. How I wish we had that, you know. But to, you're not going to find that to, with too many kids today. No, probably not. They'll get a dumpster and they'll just throw your stuff out, which is too bad. And to the extent she was right, you know, the stuff would have ended up eventually in Jim the Swappers or some other antique store or whatever we call them. Um, and that was not what she wanted, so. And when I wanted a picture of my great-grandmother, which I remembered every time we went there, it was in a beveled frame. glass yeah. frame. And you saw it as you were leaving. Yeah. I said, "Can I? Where's the picture of my great grandmother?" She said, "Oh, we threw that in the dump. Who would have wanted it?" I said, exactly. <laughs> yeah. And so I had to take a little picture like this from her prayer card. Yes. And have it yes. blown yeah. up yeah. to have a picture of my great grandmother. I hope that even though things seem to be different and everything is now on phones or these things you stick in the side of the computer or whatever. I hope that there is at least a sense of the importance of those things, you know? And I'll use one example, and I'm not embarrassing anyone, Miss B, but when Mary, their mother, died a few years ago, they gathered together all of the stuff pertaining to us, friends and neighbors, and made a box of it, and I spent hours going through that stuff from my sister's wedding invitation, the invitation to my ordination, photos of uh, Bum and Germain, and it means a great deal. You know, sometimes it's all you have, you know, left. Uh, something concrete, I mean, the, the memories, yes, absolutely, and they'll, they'll not dim, I don't think, till the eyes shut for the last time. But to have something tangible, I think, is important. I'm the one that saves it all. Yeah, well, yeah. <laughs> and well, Ryan will say, well, you keep it down. You, you know what you're doing. I said, take your stuff and get it out. Our parents' generation came through the Great Depression. And if there was one sin that was tantamount to, you know, whatever, the worst possible, it was waste. Mm -hmm. yeah. No, Nothing, yeah. nothing got wasted. Yeah. I have now helped deliver I don't know how many plastic bags of clothes that my mother probably wore in the 40s. The girls are lifting up and saying, oh my God, can you imagine anyone wearing this? <laughs> it didn't have a hole in it. It wasn't worn out, so it was there. We have not yet gone up to the attic, but God only knows what awaits there. I am convinced we will find a box of pieces of cloth. Yeah. Yep. that she had here in Putnam, that went to Hartford, that went to Groton, mm -hmm. that made their way to Dayville, and now are up in the attic, probably in shreds, I mean, or the mice have had a heyday with, I don't know. <laughs> Knowing my mother, there'll be a box of cloth up there. Mm -hmm. And the others will tell you, since they are much younger than I am, um, all of four and a half years the next time. Yeah. In any case, the old needle comes out. They don't remember these things, but I remember quite well, after the war, Mr. Whittemore on Upper School Street used to sell all kinds of grain and feed, all of which came in bags, cloth bags, that were probably made of cotton, uh, if not cotton, linen <laughs> length, they were strong. So my mother said to him, she had heard that after the war, instead of just the plain white or off-white bags, they were now printing them. Yes, he said. And what do you do with those when you empty out the grain? Well, we toss them. Oh, no, she said. No, put those aside. There is a picture somewhere, if we could find it, of the other three in shorts and tops made from grain bags that my mother rescued from this computer So you'll hear, especially from the youngest, saying, now you know why I am the way I am. <laughs> I grew up and used grain bags. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs>
So did you. Oh, my mother. 